Right, it's shortly after nine, so let's open the conference. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to MetaForum 2020. I'm happy to see at least virtually so many people of you here at the ninth MetaForum already. And I'm very happy that you all made time in your busy calendars to join us today. And this is especially appreciated because of the usual times in 2020 and because of December, which is traditionally a very busy month. So in the next couple of minutes, I will give you a brief overview of the conference and especially in terms of the program and some housekeeping items. So just as a brief recap, many of you know this slide already. MetaForum is the annual conference of MetaNet, which is a network of excellence that was founded in 2010, so 10 years ago already. Our goal is to build the technological foundations of multilingual Europe. MetaNet consists of, a, of 60 research centers in 34 European countries. And on the, on the slide, you can see a photo that we took, I think, in Berlin in November 2011. So it's been a while. And this is now already our ninth meta forum and it's obviously also the very first virtual one like last year the conference is organized by our european project european language grid meta forum 2020 is the second annual elg conference and the motto of this year's conference is piloting the european language grid and in a few minutes you will know why but let's do a quick poll first so I'm sure you know that Zoom supports uh, polls of some sorts, and we're starting a poll now. Your Zoom client will now open up the, the poll window and you can answer the two questions that you can see in this poll window. It's not visible for those of you who are joining with the browser. So those of you with a Zoom client will see the poll. So please, um, please check it out. Please respond. We leave it open for a couple of seconds. And um, then we can see what's happening here. So and I will obviously also, um, ah, okay. I can't even respond to the poll, but um, I see the responses coming in live. Um, so the questions are, is this your first MetaForum and where did you hear about MetaForum? Um, and this is so interesting. So for many of you, uh, it's the first one. I wouldn't have thought that. Um, some of you are regular attendants. And you heard, of, it's also interesting that you heard from a colleague or a friend about the conference. That's the majority. Super interesting. So um, we can leave it open for another second or two and then make the results visible, I guess. Katrin, can you? Hit the button. Okay, and this we can now see, right? This this result here. So indeed, never been to a meta forum before. 65% and heard from a colleague friend, also the top vote here, 48%. Very interesting. Thanks very much for your participation. We'll do this a number of times throughout the conference. So let's have a look at our core topic um, at the conference and in MetaNet at large. Europe is a multilingual society. Multilingualism is at the heart of the European idea. We have 24 official European Union languages and they all have the same status. In addition, we have many regional and minority languages as well as languages of immigrants, languages of important trade partners, languages of tourists and so on. And this multilingual setup creates many economic, social, and technical challenges. And only a couple of them here on the slide as examples. The digital single market won't be a single market at all if it's not multilingual. So it needs to be inclusive also from the language and, and linguistic point of view. If it's not, it will be fragmented because of language borders. So how can we use technologies to enable cross-border, cross-lingual, and cross-cultural communication? And a huge challenge here is the fragmentation of the European LT market and landscape, including the availability of language technologies and language resources. <clears throat> As MetaNet, we've been working on this topic of technology-enabled multilingualism 
for about 10 years. Several European projects prepared the ground for the European language grid as our new project. With this project, we can now finally implement a platform for the European OT community. We first voiced this need for a platform back in 2013 in our MetaNet strategic research agenda for multilingual Europe 2020. And right now, I just want to very briefly highlight one important milestone. Um, many of you remember the MetaNet language white papers that we produced together with more than 200 colleagues from all over Europe back in 2010, 2011, um, published in 2012. And this exercise resulted in the insight that at least 21 European languages are in severe danger of digital language extinction. Why? Because there is only very little technology support for these languages, if at all. And only a few languages, including English, have good level of technology support, while many other languages must be considered as severely under-resourced. We carried out this study in 2011, 2012, and technology support for many languages and also overall has improved in the meantime, thanks to neural technologies, the bigger picture appears to remain mostly the same, unfortunately. Based on the STOA report, which is not shown on the slide, but many of you know it, published in uh, 2018 and other pieces of input, the European Parliament prepared the report shown here on the slide, um, titled Language Equality in the Digital Age. And this official European Parliament resolution includes 45 recommendations on various topics, including the creation of a European LT platform for sharing of services, so European language grid, essentially. And this resolution was passed with a landslide vote of 592 votes in favor back in September 2018. The market size is also uh, highly interesting and growing and growing, and a recent study commissioned by the European Commission estimated the European LT market in 2020 to reach 1 billion euros. That's not that much compared to other markets like the, the car market or electricity, etc. But it's a sizable market, nevertheless. And it's obviously also disrupted by dominant global players. The European LT landscape consists of hundreds of companies, many of them world class, uh, but it's also very fragmented the European LT landscape, the commercial landscape, which holds back its huge potential. So a platform is needed to connect demand and supply as well as industry and research. And there's another market study which estimates the global NLP, the natural language processing market to reach almost $30 billion by 2025, which is truly incredible. So at this point, I'll stop um, with the core topics so that we can take a look at the program. So after this brief introduction, we'll have two keynote speeches in the opening session, followed by an introduction and thorough overview of the European language grid, European project and platform. And after the coffee break, which has to be virtual, unfortunately, so we can't say hi to each other and have a coffee, um, we'll talk about the ELG open calls for pilot projects, which will be presented by the Prague team along with the 10 pilot projects themselves. And the first day of Metaforum will finish up with our virtual project expo. And I'll talk about this a bit more in a minute. Tomorrow we'll present the new project European Language Equality, ELE. And we'll also have a session with news from the language communities in the form of our ELG national competence centers and a special guest. Session five, um, also tomorrow will feature a panel with representatives from various important European AI initiatives. And we'll also discuss their relationship with the LT community. And Thursday, our last day, we'll kick off with a session on ELG and the European LT industry. After a session on the sustainability of European projects, the conference will close on Thursday around lunchtime. And in between, we'll have four more virtual project expo, expo sessions. So what is that? We usually have at Metaforum uh, for those of you who are regulars, we usually have a project expo with dedicated expo sessions in the program. And this time we're trying to recreate the project expo in a virtual environment. We have five dedicated expo slots um, in which a total of 35 projects present themselves. And each project was assigned one specific time slot and its own Zoom channel. 
So when it's supposed to work exactly like a physical project expo, you walk around virtually um, in the list of projects, you can join a project booth, a virtual project booth using uh, the, exact, uh, the respective Zoom link and um, then talk to the colleagues to present their projects. So it's uh, fairly straightforward, we hope. So everybody's invited to join the virtual project expo um, and our colleagues all have prepared materials and they can show you demos and uh, what have you. So please simply join the channels. You can see uh, on the slide here, the URL where you can, can see the timetable for days one, two and three. Um, and we hope you enjoy the experience and talking to the colleagues in been, been fairly interactive and, and uh, nice way. So a bit of housekeeping and then I'm done for the overview uh, and the intro session. This is a Zoom webinar. It's not a regular Zoom meeting, it's a Zoom webinar. So only those people foreseen to speak, the panelists uh, in Zoom lingo can actually switch on their cameras and their microphones, um, which streamlines things a little bit, we think. And for question and answers, please use the Q&A section that you can see in the, in the Zoom client. Please don't use the chat window for this. Um, in the Q&A section, you can ask questions, look at questions already responded to and upload questions with a thumbs up icon. So polls, we already had one. Um, there may be more and your feedback to these polls is highly appreciated, of course. Uh, also today and on Wednesday, when you leave the Zoom meeting, you will be led to a short survey. It would be, uh, it would be much appreciated if you could fill it in and share your thoughts and opinions um, with us in this brief survey, which is a web-based survey. So, and finally, the program um, of the Project Expo is online. This link is again on the slide. Um, and then on that link, um, you can see this is the day one virtual project expo, which will be on from 12 onwards until half past one. And on the right hand side next to the project names, you can see the link to the virtual meeting room. This is a Zoom link. You can just go there, talk to the people presenting their projects um, and then hop to the next one and the next one and the next one. Uh, maybe pick them at random so that we don't have the crowd that is a bit too big at the first project and the others are waiting. So you just join them as you want. So, and these are again the project expo sessions. And this already concludes my brief opening and I would now like to hand over to um, Jan Hayek, uh, the chair of the MetaNet executive board for his introductory words. Jan. Okay, thank you, Georg. Uh, so welcome uh, ev everyone again. Uh, so we, we welcome you in the name of uh, Metanet to the, to the conference. Uh, Georg has already briefly introduced Metanet. Uh, so I think uh, the, the I, I will just say a, a few words um, on, the, on, the, on the next slide we have. Uh, uh, um, again, the information. Uh, Metanet was uh, founded in uh, 2010, and that was also the time when the first Meta Forum was uh, was held. Uh, we now have uh, 60 members, but Metanet is uh, um, is an organization of institutions. But there could be uh, there is a, a, a open and free alliance, multilingual Europe technology alliance, Meta, where anyone uh, can join. And we now have uh, almost 1,000 members. Uh, from uh, many countries, not only from Europe. So if you if you want to um, uh, get some information about uh, the developments and, uh, and possibly contribute, then uh, you are welcome to join uh, Meta as well. Uh, so again, as, as Georg said, this is the ninth uh, Meta Forum. Uh, we had one last year also supported by the European Language Grid. And, and the goals of the Meta Forum are uh, probably just saying the obvious, uh, to connect the language technology community uh, from both the research and business sides and also uh, to show it to public administrations and other uh, stakeholders. And eventually um, we would like the, uh, the Meta Forum to contribute to the strategic agendas that we are now preparing and actually in the new project that Georg mentioned, the European language equality, uh, we will need the input from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, many people. 
So uh, this is uh, this, this is just a very short uh, introduction uh, to uh, to Metanet. And then, uh, as I said, we had uh, Metaforum uh, 2019, and then we presented uh, the developments over the past uh, two years before 2019. So what happened between Metaforum 19 and today? Uh, so except for the pandemic, which we don't like, uh, there are also uh, very positive things uh, that happen. Uh, the, the European Language Grid Project opened its first open call. Uh, 10 projects are funded, and this is something uh, you will hear a lot uh, about today. And this is also the topic of this Metaforum to show uh, uh, the you know, smaller companies and uh, research organizations working with the European Language Grid in various ways. Now, of course, the cooperation continues with uh, the ongoing uh, projects from the call 29, such as Eliter. And you have seen the pointer in the chat. Eliter can now automatically subtitle, so you can uh, you can check that. Uh, Bergamot is also an MT project for uh, for text translation, and then there are four more running in um, uh, uh, still running in uh, in in the previous Horizon 2020 call. Uh, there is a new project which started this year, uh, which is one of the um, AI centers of excellence, which uh, that's, uh, that was uh, that was funded in the call 48, and uh, language technology is quite well represented in this project, and we are working on uh, our first uh, small uh, project within uh, this uh, center of excellence, and the very new one which I already mentioned is the European Language Equality Project, which should prepare the agenda for the for the following period for the for following work. Uh, uh, program. So this is really very, very briefly. Um, you will hear from these projects. You will hear about the open call projects. Uh, we are also happy to say that we have uh, just closed the second call. We have another 100 applications um, and, uh, and we will fund another uh, smaller bunch of projects uh, for, uh, for next year. So um, Welcome to Metaforum, please enjoy it. And uh, we are looking forward uh, to your feedback and uh, to, to work with you in the future. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Jan, for your opening words. Great. Um, so after, after this brief opening, the next two items on the agenda are two opening keynote speeches about uh, but which I'm very, very excited. Um, first up is uh, Patrick Bayer. I'm very, very happy that we have him with us today here. Um, um, and I don't know, Patrick, if you have a presentation or not. Uh, it wasn't very, uh, so I, I don't know if you have one, but I would like to briefly introduce Patrick. Patrick Bayer is a uh, digital freedom fighter, that's what he calls himself, a digital freedom fighter and a member of the Pirate Party. And Patrick has been a member of the European Parliament since 2019. He's a member of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, and a substitute member of the Committee on Legal Affairs. And the European Pirates are members of the Greens um, and the European Free Alliance Group. From May to May 2012 to June 2017, Patrick was a member of the Schleswig-Holstein State Parliament. That's one of the Bundesländer here in Germany, uh, the most northern one for the Pirate Party and temporarily chaired the parliamentary group. Patrick is an active member of the NGO Arbeitskreis Vorratsdatenspeicherung, working group on data retention, author of the quite famous blog Datenspeicherung.de, minimum data, maximum privacy, and he lives in beautiful Kiel. Uh, Patrick, very happy to have you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Georg, for these uh, friendly um, welcoming words, and thank you also for inviting me to, to this conference. A good morning to everybody. And um, at the beginning of your three-day uh, conference on the European language grid landscape, I'm honored to, to give an opening keynote speech for a topic which might uh, look like a small drop in the sphere of, of inclusion, but actually plays a significant role for the European Union. Now, um, having been a member of the European Parliament since last year, um, I've come to find that the European Parliament is a microcosm that um, represents uh, to a large degree the European Union in its entirety. 
And the EU, as you know, consists of a single market um, where goods, capital, services, and, and labor are free to move. And the EU is also in the process of developing a digital single market for those uh, member states that belong to it, um, where um, also uh, digital uh, goods and services will be able to um, be offered without borders. Uh, there is one element that is not single in the EU though, and that is the language. And um, in order for uh, goods and services to be able to move across borders, language obviously is of paramount importance. And in fact, the Commission acknowledges that the digital single market needs to be multilingual. In the EU, we now have 24 official languages, plus more than 60 national, regional and migrant languages. And uh, those 24 official languages are equally official in, in the meaning that there is no discrimination on any service uh, offered in one of those over the other. Now, in the European Parliament, we are lucky to have our real-time interpreters, access to administrative support and to legislative tools that we can use in all 24 official languages. But obviously that is not the case for the EU's uh, citizens and businesses. So how to address this issue? Multilingualism represents one of the greatest assets of cultural diversity in Europe. And at the same time, one of the most substantial challenges for the uh, creation of a truly integrated uh, European Union. So overcoming language barriers is crucial for the European Union in the digital era. Language technology is a bridge to multilingualism. It's not a new phenomenon. There are currently systems in place that allow um, to, to use different languages, to, to search the web, to um, use online translation services and more. Um, and these language technologies have come to be very central to our lives. But much of this technology is only available in a few widely spoken languages. So not all languages are used and offered equally, which is certainly no news to you, but um, the sector is fragmented. Even though smaller and minority languages are the ones to gain most from language technologies, tools and resources for those are often the scarcest and in some cases even non-existent. In fact, there is a widening technology gap between large and well-resourced languages. Uh, English, of course, is the number one that we're using now, um, but then come uh, French, German, Spanish, Polish, Italian, and the other official, co-official or non-official EU languages on the other side, uh, which um, some of which might actually be facing digital extinction as we've already heard. So mobile communications, social media, intelligent assistance or spe speech-based interfaces are transforming the way citizens, uh, companies and, and public administrations are um, operating in. And um, those are some of the sectors where language technologies could actually boost inclusion. And that would have positive outcomes both for the online and the offline sphere. Now the European Parliament's Science and Technology Options Assessment Panel, STOA, carried out a study on language equality in the digital age in 2017. And this study focused on presenting uh, language technologies as a valid response to the multilingual challenge. It showed that language barriers are likely to have significant social and economic consequences, such as fostering a language divide, hampering workers' mobility, hindering the access to cross-border public services, limiting citizens' engagement and participation in the political process, and creating fragmented markets for cross-border trade and e-commerce, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprises, thus seriously challenging the unity of Europe and the creation of a truly integrated digital single market. The study also showed that 
official widely spoken member state languages uh, such as Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian have the same level of language technology support or in some instances less than minority languages such as Welsh and Basque, which is a bit surprising. English is the most widely spoken language online due to the influence of American actors, but 60% of the European population do not speak or use English with high disparities among countries. In Hungary, Spain, Portugal and Bulgaria, for example, less than 20% of the population is able to speak English. In a report on language equality in the digital age, which was based on the findings of this uh, STOA study, the European Parliament identified the lack of proper investment in language technologies and asked the Commission to make sure that speakers of lesser used languages are not left behind. By the way, my uh, group had the rapporteurship for this report. The report again uh, presented language technologies as the way to go for true multilingual Europe and called on the Commission, I quote, to establish a large scale long term coordinated funding program for research, development, and innovation in the field of language technologies at European, national, and regional levels tailored specifically to Europe's needs and demands, emphasizes that the program should seek to tackle deep natural language understanding and increase efficiency by sharing knowledge, infrastructures and resources with a view to developing innovative technologies and services in order to achieve the next scientific breakthrough in this area and help reduce the technology gap between European languages. A breakthrough of this report was to recognize sign languages as an important element of Europe's linguistic diversity and include them in the scope of language technologies. The report also called for research policies such as establishing a large scale long term funding program for research and development and innovation and the creation of a European language technology platform. On educational policies, the report called for the inclusion of language technologies in education in order to teach how these are used and make sure um, they uh, will be used more widely in the future. On market policies, it's worth noting that um, the inclusion of more languages results in a, a larger audience, which would particularly benefit small enterprises and startups to increase their uh, reachability and be able to compete in a single market. Following up to the um, report, uh, my group submitted a proposal for a pilot project that was awarded an A grade by the Commission. And um, it's expected to initiate on uh, the 1st of January of, of next year and run for two years. And it aims at developing a strategic research, innovation, and implementation agenda and a roadmap for achieving full digital language equality in Europe by 2030. An ambitious aim, but uh, we need to get started at some point. And we hope that um, this can help reveal the full potential of uh, language technologies and set the road for their recognition and development. Solutions obviously will not appear by themselves. So uh, we've made uh, only the first step uh, for recognizing this uh, challenge and we've identified ways to solve it in the European Parliament and um, this should be found beyond a one sector uh, policy and um, the solution really lies in multiple policy sectors um, ranging from institutional to industry um, the market education and public policy sectors uh, so far, the EU is investing relatively little in language technologies compared to the United States or Asia, for example, and we are even falling further behind and we need to do better than this. Language technologies are really critical pieces of technology to um, aid and support in this digital revolution that we are experiencing. They are not yet properly represented on the agendas of European policy makers. 
your meta language grid project, which is to, to map technological solutions, is certainly a significant contribution to, to this aim. We need to continue um, following this path and um, use the value of inclusion as a compass for future policies to make sure that no one is left behind. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Patrick, for your, for your um, opening keynote speech, for your insights and, and valuable contribution. Much appreciated and many thanks also to you and your group for your support. Um, right, and I guess a uh, virtual round of applause <laughs> for you as you here, which, uh, which we, we can't provide right now, but next time we will meet face to face, we will, uh, we will do that. So thanks again, Patrick, for your keynote. Um, next up in the list of two keynotes is um, a speech by, not by the European Parliament, but by the other European institution, the European Commission is now taking the stage, Ivo Wollmann, Director of Directorate G in DG Connect. Um, Ivo Wollmann um, studied at the universities of Amsterdam and Strasbourg, and he holds a PhD in European law awarded by the European University Institute in Florence. He worked for the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs in the areas of industrial and technology policy before joining the European Commission in 1998. And in the European Commission, he dealt with legislative and strategic issues as well as funding programs related to the information market digitization and data. Um, very happy to have you, Ivo, uh, with us today, and the floor is yours. Yes, good morning. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, invitation to speak, and in particular, of course, Georg, uh, the ELG project coordinator. Now, this is the, the second uh, conference of the European Language Grid, and already the ninth edition of the Meta Forum. Well, this has become a tradition almost, uh, bringing together European research, industry, and innovation experts in, in language technologies. Still, I, I saw there was a 65% uh, new faces, and uh, actually I'm, I'm, I'm one of those new faces. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that the topic is not close to my heart. Um, you mentioned my, uh, my PhD, and actually my PhD was on uh, the multilingualism of European law 30 years ago. <laughs> so the topic is really something that touches me. Now, uh, we're meeting virtually. It's, um, it's a new experience in a way, but it also shows how digital has come to dominate our lives even more than, than before the crisis, right? Now, the crisis, it, it has created havoc, of course, but it has also shown um, a number of remarkable collaboration efforts. And one of these collaboration efforts is, is done by the um, language technologies communities, um, bringing together all kinds of resources on COVID in different languages. So we are very happy as a commission to support the COVID-19 multilingual information access initiatives. And um, this initiative is of course based on sharing European institutions, universities, private companies, but also the, the top 50 news providers in the EU have agreed to let the Um, it shows that when the language technology community unites around the topic, they can they can really do a lot. Now, more than the crisis. <clears throat> Looking beyond the crisis, there's of course this enormous potential for economic development, but also for creating the digital society. And the community has been working for many years to enable all Europeans to benefit equally from.
I think we have lost Evo. Right. Katrin, can you check if he's still in the list of no, participants? He's still. He isn't. He jumped out. Ah, okay. So let's maybe wait a minute to see if he can rejoin. Yeah. Ah, he's back. Very good. Maybe he should switch off the camera. Right, Ivo, we, we lost you. I guess we, you're back now. So the floor is still yours. <laughs> okay, I'm there and I'm going to try the video. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm back. Okay, mm -hmm. okay well, this, this is also the delights of working uh, digitally. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen an event where this kind of thing has not happened. So <laughs> it does happen, then it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, so I was I was saying that basically, um, well, the work of the language community and the language technologies community has, has uh, benefited Europeans and it allows them to participate in the digital sphere, no, no matter what language they, they speak. Um, now, of course, a lot of progress has been made over the last years, but uh, we are not there yet. and. The presence of you today, well, shows that there is the willingness to make uh, to make a difference there. I, I want to zoom out for a moment and look at the bigger policy picture. Now, it's it's actually hard to believe that the current commission has been uh, in place only for for one year. And if you look at the initiatives that has the commission has presented its program, but also the initiatives in the first 100 days, that the, the data strategy, the digital society strategy, well, you can see that the language technologies fit in really, really well into that, that picture. So um, I would say that the work you're doing is very well aligned to make Europe fit for the digital age. So um, language technologies are, are, are the basis for a lot of the elements of the digital transformation, well, from search engines to the online interaction between uh, between persons and they're also very important for solutions that ensure that european values in the digital world are upheld uh, for example web accessibility inclusive tools but more in general uh, access to public services um, things ranging from detecting grooming efforts but also more in general, overcoming language barriers. It was mentioned before. Now, um, what is also interesting is that language tools can be instrumental for privacy. And here I'm, I'm, I can point at some of the outstanding research results of the projects um, that, that we are funding, for example, on data anonymization. If you look at the Comprise project that's working on the preserving the, the privacy of language related data for, for speech recognition, or if you look at Bergamot uh, that actually looks at privacy preserving machine translation for web browsers, well, these, these are excellent projects and, and we're really uh, happy about what's happening there. Um, then another example of the EU values. Well, of course, the EU supports an open, democratic and sustainable society. It's, it's based on technologies that can be trusted. And there, I would like to make first the, the, the link between language technologies and the disinformation debate. Um, languages, language technologies are really central in detecting and to fight disinformation online. For example, uh, the We Verify project also under Horizon 2020 uh, has really developed powerful language tools that helps uh, fact checkers across the world. And there's more, there's more. Um, language technologies are also essential to ensure that all Europeans can participate to the European public debate. For example, this conference on the future of, of Europe that's coming, right? It calls for, and now I quote, an open and inclusive debate across Europe about the future priorities of the EU and concrete solutions on how to em emerge stronger and more resilient from the current crisis. But how can we have this type of debate if not everyone, not depending on the language they speak, can participate online and offline? And there, the language technologies can really make a difference. Now, my question to you is, is the technology ready to allow for such a multilingual political debate in Europe? And 
perhaps not completely yet. So that, that's a challenge. And well, of course, uh, several Horizon 2020 projects bring us closer to this objective. Uh, the Eliter project, it was mentioned on your slides. It, it improves the online meeting experience through automatic speech recognition and minuting. Or of course, the, the, the projects Gourmet and, and Embedia that uh, address under-resourced languages. Now, another big question where language technologies come in is more economic. It's, it's the issue of strategic autonomy. And of course, this is also linked to the question of fairness in, in the digital economy, where the Commission is going to make some, some big proposals in the coming weeks. Now, we know that in the digital world, there, there are a handful of companies that get the bulk of the value that's created uh, based on data. And the language technologies make it possible to offer this, to, to, to expand the services and the offer uh, of these, these companies to new markets. And this generates more data that can be used for developing language technologies. Well, in a way, it's a self-reinforcing mechanism that has an important impact on the, the European digital markets. And there the question is, can we really afford to depend on non-European players for something that touches so much the core of Europe's being, right? And where so much control over data is at stake also, so how can we reduce Europe's current over-reliance on, on digital solutions created elsewhere, but in particular language technologies? Now, if you look at the language technologies market, it's, it's dominated by the, by the GAFAM, right? Uh, both the B2C and the B2B markets. And China is moving in with, with Alibaba, Tencent and Baidu. Um, and a recent study conducted by the EC shows that more than 80% of European SMEs are using automatic translation. Uh, they, they, they rely on the free Google Translate. Well, it's free to a certain extent, of course, uh, as, as we know. Even if they're aware of the risk of information leakage and, leakage, and even if it means that the data go to, uh, to Google. And of course, there, there, there are the products and services with no European equivalent, such as Siri, Alexa, uh, Baidu Assistant, just to name a few. And this raises further concerns about security, privacy, but also about <clears throat> Europe's strategic and technological autonomy. Now, you are the ones who can really make the difference in this respect, right? So Horizon uh, 2020 funding has, has helped create the European language grid. Well, it's, it's a one-stop shop mechanism that tackles the fragmentation of the European language technology market. And of course, uh, this, this is key. And this is also in line with the recommendations of the, of the European Parliament in 2018, uh, we, we heard about before. Now, we hope that the European language grid is going to become the primary platform for language technologies in Europe, and that it will allow companies to really easily access the latest and appropriate technologies. And with a sustainable business model, uh, ELG or its future developments are, can really reduce the current reliance on, on non-European language technology solutions. And this brings me to the topic of data. So in February, the commission published its data strategy. And the aim is to create a real genuine single market for data, a European data space based on European rules and values. Now, data needs to be widely and easily available and also to simple to, to use and process. And last week we adopted our first the big proposal for a horizontal legal instrument, the Data Governance Act. And one of the aims of the data strategy is to to develop EU-wide common European data spaces in key industrial and societal sectors, the Green Deal, mobility, manufacturing, agricultural health. And I see the relation between data and language, language technologies going in two directions. On the one hand, language technologies are, are key for exploiting the potential of data in Europe, for example, automatic translation of metadata. But then there is the data availability, which is really key for improving the, the language technologies. And, and here, the, the European Commission has played a key role in encouraging shared access, opening up and opening up of language resources, held in particular by the public administration, but not only. Um, and the L European Language Research Coordination Initiative, I think, has already made a, a difference there. We have got the ELRC share repository 
it's, it's very rich. It contains more than 2000 language data sets covering all the EU languages. And uh, most, resource, most resources <clears throat> um, are multilingual offering around 22 billion, billion bilingual sentences. Um, now, further data sets are made available by, by language resource projects like the uh, Paracrawl project, um, another important one that's funded from the Connecting Europe facilities program. Now, of course, these developments are fully in line with Europe's open data policies that aims at making more publicly produced data available for innovative users. And the link between data and language technologies, it, it will be present in the digital program. Um, so don't only count on Horizon uh, for funding, but also look at the digital program. The program is going to have an important focus on, on data. And one of the measures that can be interesting for you is the support of the data spaces through a coordination center where uh, multilingual aspects will be, will be also very present. Now, a last theme I would like to, to touch upon is how language technologies fit into the technologies of the future. Uh, well, we know that language technologies are behind virtually every digital product we use every day now. Huh? The, the search engines, digital marketing, chat box, digital health services, etc. Um, one, one concrete example, actually, that's what we're doing now, uh, video conferencing. It, it has become an essential commodity over the past months. So we use video conferencing on a daily basis, sometimes things go wrong, but okay, that's uh, that's okay, the technology is here. You, you can hire an alpaca to join into your Zoom meetings for under uh, 10 euros. Um, so it's, it, it's happening, but still um, seamless multilingual video conferencing systems who are accessible, that are accessible to persons with and without disabilities with real-time exchange between people speaking different languages. Are we there? No, no, no. This is really something for the future and we are, we are, we are not there. Now, um, looking further into the future, language technologies are also going to be a key for future interactive models. For example, extending human perception beyond text and speech to include additional modalities such as vision and touch. Now, we will have conversational systems, smart assistant, assistants and interactive agents that work irrespective of the language. They will be able to take decisions autonomously. They will ensure meaningful human control and, and, and privacy. <laughs> so we think there will be an efficient semantic based multilingual and multimodal search engines and, and uh, there will be language transparent telepresence solutions, but to get there more research is necessary. Um, we need to improve our European data discovery and analytics capacity, but, but also develop new interactive models, taking into account the languages, but also other modalities. So the point I want to make there is language technologies are part of a broader research agenda, and we must make sure that these connections are properly made. Um, now I come to my conclusion. Um, language technologies for the first time ever really offer the prospect of a multilingual digital single market at, at an acceptable cost and at a, a good quality an acceptable standard. And Europe needs multilingualism. Europe needs powerful language technologies made in Europe for Europe. And in order to make that happen, we must cooperate. Uh, we must exploit and expand the unprecedented Opportunities, opportunities offered by language technologies, both in the public and the private sector. And this means in the first place that we have to, to use what has been developed already. So we have to make sure that the language technologies and resources that have been developed in the European and national RNI programs can really be easily deployed by or for the benefit of the European public and private sector. Now, then we also need to look into the future. So where do language technologies fit in considering the changing te technological landscape? So can we build language technologies into a, a broader research agenda that combines data use and user interaction 
uh, in multilingual environments? And these are some of the questions I would like to throw at you also for this, uh, this conference. Now, we will continue as Europe to invest in language technologies through funding programs like digital, of course, also Horizon, um, but also have a look at the opportunities offered by the Resilience and Recovery Facility Right, this big package uh, of that that has been uh, well almost uh, agreed. So plans are being drawn up right now by the member states um, with all the initiative initiatives that are going to be funded. So you better make sure that you're there, that you're in that agenda, uh, also for the language resources and the language technologies. So. Many thanks again for the invitation. I'm, I'm very honored to, to speak at this conference. And uh, this is indeed the place to learn about everything that happens around uh, European language technology. And I'm, I'm looking forward to see the upcoming release of the European Language Grid platform. And I wish you a very good and lively online event with enriching exchanges. And well, I hope no more technical issues. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Ivo. Thank you very much for the uh, very comprehensive and, and all-encompassing um, speech and all your observations, which we will absolutely honor and take on board, of course. And we will try to be there in these agendas. And, um, and I hope that especially the output of, of ELG and also of the upcoming project, European Language Equality, will be able to make a difference in that regard. So thanks again. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, also virtual round of applause for you. Thank you. Right, so that concludes our two keynote speeches and we will, without a break, move on to the uh, last part of uh, the opening session and that's the um, short, shortish presentation of the current state of play of the European Language Grid project um, that we will do together with uh, two colleagues of the project, uh, Kalina Boncheva and Stelios Piparides. So I will, I will go first. I will give a very brief, broad overview of the project and different activities that we're doing. Um, Kalina Boncheva will then provide an overview of the services and resources um, area in the ELG platform and project. And uh, Finally, Stereos Pipalides will present the ELG cloud platform. So let's kick off with a, with a quick overview and I will try to be brief. So ELG has a couple of objectives and the, the most important one is to establish the ELG, the ELG cloud platform as the primary language technology platform and marketplace in Europe to tackle the fragmentation of the European landscape that was mentioned a number of times already this morning. We have a consortium of nine partners uh, that you can see here on the screen. Um, so DFKI, ILSP, University of Sheffield, Charles University, ELDA, TILDE, Say Labs, Expert System, and the University of Edinburgh. And together we have very good working relationships with all relevant initiatives that we have in Europe. I only have one slide on the ELG cloud platform because Kalina and especially Stelios will talk about this in depth. Um, so here you can see the shiny high level architecture overview, um, how users can connect to the ELG cloud platform through various means, through APIs, through remote APIs. We have user interfaces. Uh, there is a Python client library coming up. And here on the screen, um, bottom left corner, you can see um, the stats of ELG release one. That was the, the statistics back in June, July 2020. Um, back then, we had 539 entries in the ELG catalog with 160 functional services and 358 data sets and language resources. And in a second, you will see what the current state is today. So, who are main, our main stakeholders? Are companies that develop language technologies, companies that integrate language technologies, and companies that purchase language technologies. And also on the academic side of things, universities and research centers that develop 
language technologies and some of them even use language technologies, for example, for research purposes. Um, many different areas come to mind. Also public administrations, other organizations, NGOs and funding agencies, of course. So we've heard that the European LT industry is very big. It's very fragmented, which is not very good. Um, we have many companies, many SME companies, many small companies, up to 20, 30, 40 um, employees, and they operate often in niches based on application type, based on language, maybe based on the region or combinations thereof. Um, and what we need to do is to bring these European LT industry participants and members together fully to exploit the potential of the European LT industry. So, and today we are all proud and very happy to announce something new. Um, so ELG, with a lot of help from the 32 national competence centers, uh, has compiled lists of companies and also academic organizations that develop language technology in all European countries. And um, today we are announcing and, and uh, releasing, publishing these lists in the form of ELG catalog entries. And many thanks are also due to Yulia Akulkova from the company NIMSI. Um, a couple of months ago, we stumbled upon the NIMSI LT Atlas, the language technology atlas, which they provided to us. Thanks very much for this input, Yulia. And today we make the first part of this exercise available, um, which is a comprehensive list of more than 900 European LT companies which are now available in the ELG. And why is it important? Of course, to bootstrap the ELG catalog and the eventual ELG community. So how does it work? These, um, these, these metadata entries, the catalog entries in ELG, they are online now. You can check them out. I have, I have a, a screenshot on the next slide. Um, what, what does it mean? So a representative of a company that is now listed in ELG can, if they don't have one already, create a login in the ELG platform, they can claim the company's ELG entry um, that we created for them, or they can even delete it and opt out. That's also possible, of course. The ELG team checks if this uh, claim request is legit le legitimate, and then the company can start using the page and can start maintaining its ELG profile page, um, and then upload services, upload resources. So um, here's a screenshot, so that should be uh, live now in the live version of the language grid, 927 organizations, and you can see the stats here on the screen, um, about 100 companies. We have many of these companies in, in Germany, actually, Netherlands, Spain, France, UK, and then there's a tale of, of many other companies in many European uh, countries. So this is very, very good and a very nice development to bootstrap the visibility of ELG. In addition, uh, many of these projects have already been mentioned. Um, we, uh, Jan Hayic mentioned the ELG open calls. The first 10 pilot projects are up and running. We collaborate with the ICT 29B projects, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. ELG um, is collaborating with the ELE project, which is coming up. The European AI on Demand platform is an important collaboration partner and many other European projects and networks and initiatives as well, such as CLEA, the upcoming AI PPP, and um, the Humane AI Net project. I mentioned the NCCs. Um, we will have a session with some NCCs and a special guest tomorrow at 9.30. These are our 32 national competence centers as a strong international network of national networks to broaden the ELG's reach and to identify content for the ELG and interest companies in using the ELG. And this main goal of this group of national competence centers is to support the mission of the project. In addition, we are working on the sustainability model and the operational model and the legal entity of ELG. It's a limited project runtime as usual with the European project. Um, we are working on the sustainability um, we've identified several ways and approaches of covering the costs that are being uh, created by running the platform, by having a team, etc., that all needs to be covered on a long-term basis. This is all work in progress, um, and we can talk about the current state of play on Thursday 
in the sustainability session and the um, current plan is to establish the legal entity in late 2021 or in early 2022. We extended the project. Um, I haven't said that yet. We extended the ELG project by half a year due to the COVID crisis. So uh, ELG will finish up in June 2022. Um, brief overview before in the next session, we talk a lot more about the open calls for pilot projects. Yesterday, last night, the open call two was closed. And again, great success with 106 submitted pro project proposals. We were all super stoked about this. In the first round, we had 110 project proposals. And next up in the session, starting at 10.45, we will present them one by one. We also um, had a couple of publications on ELG. We had three papers um, on ELG and ELG-related topics at LREC. Um, just in case that you work with ELG, that you want to cite ELG in a formal way, these are the, site, the, the papers to cite. In your uh, scientific publications, we also had, that was also an important activity this year, the IWLTP workshop at LREC, the International Workshop on Language Technology Platforms, uh, which had um, also a great number of submissions, 30 papers and 17 were selected for publication. And um, I'm also happy to announce now that coming up in early 2021 will be a call for papers for a special issue of the LRE journal on LT platform topics coming out of this um, IWLTP workshop. So watch your email inboxes for the call for papers. And I think this is my last slide, the European Language Equality Project, which is a sister project to ELG. It's a consortium of 53 partners from all over Europe. Um, all countries are covered. The coordinator is the ADAPT Center, Andy Way in, in Ireland. Um, the objective, as Patrick mentioned, it's a handful. The objective of the project is to develop a strategic research, innovation, and deployment agenda to achieve digital language equality in Europe by 2030. It's an ambitious goal, but we are certain that we can pull it off. It's a runtime of 18 months. So ELE and ELG will both end in June 2022. And we have a dedicated session on the project tomorrow at 9 o'clock. In terms of positioning, um, ELG wants to do a couple of things. It wants to be the main platform and marketplace of the European LT community. It wants to be an act as the bridge between the language-centric AI community and the broader European AI community as assembled in, for example, CLEAR, AI for EU, Humane AI Net, the Emerging AI PPP, and other initiatives, and also as an infrastructure for future Horizon Europe and maybe Digital Europe projects. That was uh, my brief overview, and I would now like to hand over to uh, Kalina Boncheva uh, from the University of Sheffield, who will talk about the current state of play in terms of services and resources available in ELG. Kalina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Georg. Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be um, virtually seeing you today. So uh, as Georg said, I will talk briefly about the current state of play. And uh, I will give you a preview of the release too, which is coming in February. And uh, then our plans for the final release before the end of the project. So what you can see here, uh, for those of you who were um, there uh, last year, is um, that there have been a number of new services uh, integrated. And when you are uh, going on the um, EOG platform and exploring what is available, uh, you are presented with um, this type of user interface. I won't go into details here because Telios will be giving you very detailed walkthrough and demonstration. But as you can see, you can see the different types of services, the licenses that they offer and uh, so on. So the current state of play, um, as of our release one, which was in April, um, we finalized the APIs uh, for the major types of services. So we have uh, currently support for ASR services, information extraction services, machine translation services, and text-to-speech services. But we're also working on a number of others. Uh, one particular one to mention here, for example, is support for Sparkle endpoints um, as part of one of our new pilot projects with Corian. 
Uh, so uh, the concentration in the current release uh, is on a subset of the European languages. Uh, so as you can see, the seven ones listed here, Czech, English, French, German, Greek, um, Latvian, Spanish, and um, these are essentially the native ones for the consortium. Um, there are uh, nine ASR services, the uh, seven ones listed above, plus Estonian and Lithuanian. And uh, there are 150 distinct services providing different types of information extraction. Um, they are, again, heavily skewed towards English, as we have discussed already. Um, but uh, there's a lot of them also for German, French and uh, Greek, as you can see. Um, now, I need to um, explain a little bit here, because if you do go online, you will see that, um, you know, when you add up those numbers, um, it might not, you know, it, you may discover that there's a bit of what looks like a discrepancy. But basically, um, in the actual catalog of the EOG, we have fewer entries because often and one single endpoint will uh, offer several different languages uh, and different functions. So you may have one component that will basically be offering both tokenization and direct recognition, part, part of speech tagging, or it could be offering different languages. So some of them can be offering up to 30 or 50 languages. Um, so this is how, um, you know, what it looks like, discrepancy, depending how you're counting. And then there's different machine translation um, languages uh, supported to and from English, and a few others supported for free. I'll give you an idea next. And then there's two text-to-speech systems, Latvian and Lithuanian. So here you can see the details of the different services provided by the different partners. Um, for machine translation, um, for ASR, for text-to-speech as well, as I mentioned already. And then um, this one that you won't be able to read very well because it's quite small is the information extraction. But the takeaway message here is that the partners have provided a large number of services, very diverse ones as well. So going beyond the basics of uh, part of speech tagging, tokenization, but also information extraction, summarization, and uh, so on. Um, at this point, I'd also like to mention that that um, we are uh, very proud to be incorporating and already uh, providing services from a number of European projects. So uh, we verify was one of those already mentioned. Um, and through the University of Sheffield, we are integrating a number of those in ELG uh, and are planning to continue to do so as the WeVerify project produces new ones. Uh, we also have uh, some services produced by uh, the projects Lynx and Bergamo that you heard about already. Um, Edinburgh's machine translation services as well are also from the SUMA project, uh, Modern MT and some others. Um, there's also the Carbonet and Serbic data ones uh, from previously. So it's quite a, uh, a rich uh, set that has built on a lot of previous work and has made that now available to everybody in the EU to, in an easy to use format. Next slide, please. So uh, we are now approaching release two, uh, which is going to happen in February 2021. And um, it will add support for other EU and related languages. Um, and the plan is to provide at least another eight additional ASR services between 200 and 250 uh, additional information extraction and text analytics services, uh, 23 additional machine translation services, and nine text-to-speech services. We are also going to broaden the scope, as I mentioned, to support other types of services. So, for example, one service that we'll be um, incorporating as well is um, meme and advert OCR. So you will be able to uh, uh, provide this content and then uh, it will be transcribed automatically in several languages. Um, we are also expecting that the first services and data sets from the pilot projects will come on stream uh, and uh, more details uh, you will find about those uh, later in the conference. So looking further ahead, um, the release three is uh, due in early 2022, and it will introduce uh, services for an even wider range of languages, including some non-EU ones. Uh, the current projection that we have at the moment is at least for 15 further ASR services, 160 further information extraction and text analytics, and nine further machine translation. Um, other types uh, are also envisaged, as I mentioned before. 
So um, adding your own services to EOG is uh, very, very easy. Um, uh, the current tools um, can uh, take as little as a few hours to a few days. It depends really on how close they are to our uh, existing model. Um, and then we are working to uh, provide help and um, code to actually uh, bring this effort down even further. Uh, we have some helper libraries that deal with much of the complexities. Uh, for example, there's the Spring Boot Starter for Java, and we're working on a Python help implementation. Um, we are working also on a lot of uh, documentation in support to allow um, other projects and other companies to start really integrating and making use of the EOG uh, services and tools. And in a true eat your own dog food scenario, uh, we are heavily working with, uh, we verify because they are very interested in integrating the EOG machine translation services into the uh, fact checker tools produced in the project, which means they will go live to all the fact checkers within the next six months most. Um, so uh, here is an example about how you can add your own services to EOG. We have just launched a new graphical editor and Stelios will talk about that in more detail, so I won't go in depth here. Um, the language resources and the current state of play there is that uh, we have approximately 280 uh, free available language resources integrated. This was at release one and uh, since then we completed the ingestion of uh, material from um, EL, ELRA, ELRC share, uh, ELRC share LRs, and Lindat uh, Claria. So um, we are in the process of integrating other repositories, um, so Zenodo and Quantum Stats. Um, so these are all a lot of language resources taken together. You'll see statistics uh, in the next slide. Um, the different procedures depend on the repository, and uh, some repositories are easier than others. Um, and uh, where we can, we are hosting the content within EOG to make it easier for the users. But in other cases, we are hosting just the metadata and referring back to the source repository. So here to give you just the overview of what's available, you can see that Corpora are the main um, sort of uh, type of LR that we have. Um, but we also have a lot of lexical and conceptual resources, as well as some models and computational grammars. And as I said, this, these numbers are set to grow very significantly going forwards. So next steps uh, are uh, pop uh, integration of MetaShare um, is uh, in progress and uh, the, um, the, uh, we are ingesting the uh, content into EOG. Um, there's over 200 repositories that we have identified as relevant. Um, so Zenodo is the one that um, is in progress. Um, and then the next one is Quantum Stat, as I already mentioned, is about 100, uh, 480 data set records that we're uh, working on at the moment. And then there's uh, also other repositories that will be slowly integrating. And of course, last but not least, the LRs from the pilot projects. So at this yeah. point, I think I hand over to my colleague Stelios Piperidis from Athens. Great, thanks you, Kalina. Thank you, Kalina. And uh, Stelios, floor is yours. Thank you, Kalina. Thank you, Georg. So uh, good morning, everyone from uh, rather cloudy Athens today. Um, the section of uh, uh, the ELG session will dive into the ELG platform specifics. I will be briefly presenting to you the ELG platform architecture, the services it makes available for information seekers and consumers of language data and services, the services ELG offers to providers of language technologies, as well as the, the bridges that we're trying to build with initiatives in the wider area of language technologies and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, the ELG platform architecture diagrammatically ELG is, is a three layered platform comprising the ELG base infrastructure, the platform backend and the platform front end exposing the platform's user interfaces. All layers are built with using robust, scalable, reliable and widely used technologies which are constantly developed further by the uh, respective communities. Uh, the technical choices made provide the ability to scale with the growing demand and supply of uh, resources and services, 
while the overall architecture and data models employed have been designed in such a way so that they can provide the foundations for bringing data and services uh, together and creating spaces of as interoperable as possible language data and language processing services, following also what, what Evo uh, uh, said uh, a while ago. Uh, the ELG uh, uh, base infrastructure is the layer on which all the software components, language processing services and data sets, as well as other types of data are stored, uh, deployed and run. Uh, it is important to note that all software components of ELG, backend and frontend components, as well as language technology services, are packaged as containers. Huh? That is standard units of software that package up code and all dependencies so the applications can quickly and reliably run from one computing environment to another, thus addressing some of the lower level interoperability issues that, uh, that we've been facing in, in, in the past. For containerization, ELG uses Docker containers. Uh, a Docker image is a lightweight standalone executable package of software that includes everything uh, that you need to run uh, 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 an application. Uh, Docker containers are orchestrated by Kubernetes, which automates the allocation of hardware to the services running in the grid application. It monitors services and traffic. It routes and balances computing load. It scales services up or down according to their load. And it ensures redundancy and uptime of services by automatically replacing units of service if they fail or become unresponsive, and so on and so forth. The base infrastructure also provides uh, an S3 compatible storage solution and all the supporting tools that facilitate the development and management of the ELG software and later on uh, the monitoring of, uh, of its usage. Moving to the uh, ELG backend. Next slide, please, Georg. Uh, turning to the ELG backend, this is designed and implemented in such a way so as to provide all the functionalities uh, that we need for the smooth operation of the of the whole platform. The backend layer contains the ELG platform repository and catalog, the LT service execution server, the user management component, as well as the Drupal backend, which is the backend of the content management system that uh, supports the informational part, uh, let's say, of the ELG. The ELG platform repository and catalog is the application responsible for managing the metadata records, the database for storing them, and the indexing mechanism. The catalog backend uh, includes functionalities related to metadata management, uh, that is creation, retrieval, update, and deletion of uh, metadata records, content management, so uh, uh, functionalities for upload of content that is associated with metadata records, metadata indexing for search and fast retrieval, user management, metadata harvesting using open protocols, different types of analytics, and uh, later on in uh, uh, the upcoming release three uh, billing services. The LT execution server, sorry, Georg, can you go back? Yeah. The LT execution server is responsible for the invocation of the containerized language technology tools that are hosted at the ELG cloud infrastructure or the ones that run remotely in, in, in external servers. The server implements uh, a common public REST API for calling integrated functional services, and it orchestrates their uh, uh, execution by retrieving the specific REST endpoint of the service, calling the LT service, and uh, checking quota management, keeping statistics, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. On the user management uh, side, we have defined a set of broad user categories. So we have unregistered users and registered users who are assigned the roles of consumers, providers, reviewers, and uh, administrators. We believe that with uh, these roles, we can appropriately address the requirements for the management of the platform operations and the publication procedure, or uh, what we call the publication lifecycle of, uh, of resources. Uh, important to note, all backend components that have been developed for ELG uh, have been designed in such a way that uh, they offer their functionalities via uh, REST services. And moving to, to, to the front end, 
uh, users will, will be will be able to interact with the ELG platform through an interactive modern web-based uh, front end by consuming the REST services I mentioned before, exposed by the ELG platform backend. Uh, the ELG front end provides interfaces for consumers of data and services that uh, and related content. Uh, that is essentially services like browsing, uh, uh, searching, retrieving, and rendering the requested pieces of information. Interfaces for providers of various resources, data services, related entities like projects and organizations that Georg mentioned before. Uh, and these are interfaces for providing and editing descriptions of these items, as well as uh, the respective user dashboards. Uh, last but not least, administration interfaces that we're using on the ELG uh, uh, side uh, for instance, for validating uh, metadata records of uh, um, uh, data, especially services, and uh, of course, uh, records of the related entities, projects, organizations, and, uh, and the like. Uh, the front end also includes uh, interfaces for trying out language processing services, as well as providing code samples if a user wants to send a processing request from uh, the command line to a specific, uh, to a specific service. Uh, last but not least, the ELG website will be offering information about conference and training events, open calls, pilot projects, and we hope other interesting pieces of, uh, of uh, information. Next slide, please. So uh, on the data consumer side, ELG consumers can search and browse the ELG catalog for different types of uh, data. Uh, that is uh, corpora, lexical and conceptual resources, language processing services, and language descriptions. By language descriptions, essentially, we, we, we mean language models of various types uh, and, and, and sorts. Searching can be performed using either simple keyword-based search or advanced search using facets. Uh, currently, we have been uh, uh, deploying facets for resource type, uh, corpus service, etc. Language, service function, part of speech tagging, dependency parsing, machine translation, speech recognition, and so on and so forth. Terms of use, essentially the licensing condition of uh, of the particular data set or service, and uh, uh, related entities, entities that relate to the particular data or or uh, or service. Uh, ELG users and uh, consumers can download uh, the resources, while they can also view the number of times a specific resource has been used or its description has been viewed, thus somehow uh, giving an idea of the attractiveness, uh, let's say, of the, of the, of the specific item. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, and this is something that we implemented uh, 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 as, as, as teasers uh, for what is coming up, uh, users can get an idea of what is forthcoming in terms of uh, data or services through appropriately tagged descriptions uh, uh, in, in, in the record. So there, there will be some records that you will see uh, uh, which uh, are tagged as under construction. Um, on the services consumer side, just a few words. Um, uh, such consumers can try out and test language services or call them from the command line and uh, why not integrate them in, uh, in their own workflows. Uh, these ways of using uh, ELG's language services are supported by common public REST APIs that have been specified for uh, uh, five types, uh, five classes, let's say, of uh, uh, technologies, uh, machine translation, information extraction, text classification, speech recognition, and, uh, and speech synthesis. Uh, users will need to be registered uh, for uh, trying out and uh, consuming these services. And uh, please note that uh, at least for the time being, but also for the foreseeable future, uh, I guess, uh, daily quotas apply uh, for, uh, for their use. Uh, last but not least, and it, it, is, it is really important in this seamless flow from uh, 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 data to technology development, uh, ELG consumers will also be able to use a Python-based API for accessing the ELG catalog directly, searching and fetching data sets to feed them into, for instance, their model training uh, uh, pipeline. 
Can I have the next slide, Georg? Now moving to the providers, the ELG providers are the cornerstone of, uh, of, of ELG. Uh, they can register and upload language data services uh, or other resources like their projects or organizations, uh, organization pages uh, following a few steps. First, they have to be, to be registered, get authenticated and be assigned a provider uh, status. Following that, using a formal metadata schema, they can provide descriptions of their resources, either by uploading a schema compliant XML file or by uh, a recently released interactive metadata editor. This is something that we released uh, three, four days ago, uh, but you're more than welcome to, 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 to try it and to give us feedback. Uh, the interactive uh, metadata editor implements the ELG uh, uh, metadata schema. Uh, just a few words about this. Uh, the ELG metadata schema builds upon the MetaShare metadata model, for those of you who have heard a bit, uh, about it, uh, and uh, some of the application profiles of the MetaShare metadata model, namely uh, uh, ELRC Share, which has already been mentioned, open-minded share, um, uh, and the CEF AT catalog for tools and services that is also deployed and running uh, on the CEF digital website, uh, as well as the MSO, uh, which is the RDF own representation of, uh, of the model. The ELG schema uh, is used for the description of all entities of interest to uh, the ELG, and it constitutes the backbone of the, of the ELG catalog. It brings together language services and tools, data sets of different types and media, models, et cetera, as well as uh, uh, agents, actors, uh, activities, technologies, and business application areas uh, that are related to, to, to language technologies. Uh, its structure is simpler uh, than the MetaShare meta, met, uh, metadata uh, uh, model, but it retains the expressive power of, of the parent schemas. It is flexible and it complies with the fair principles the fairness was also mentioned uh, a while ago and it is really an important ingredient of uh, today but also of what is coming up uh, last but not least we hope that it ensures interoperability with other metadata schemas and uh, and vocabularies uh, for anything they might need about resources, provision, providers can get support through the online documentation. There is a specific tab on, uh, on the ELG uh, uh, platform. Uh, ELG providers are also offered their own user dashboard where they can view their own items, resources, uh, uh, etc., including their status according to the ELG publication lifecycle. Uh, this life cycle essentially depicts the status and evolution of the metadata record of a resource and includes four main uh, uh, statuses, uh, draft, syntactically valid, submitted for publication, and, uh, and published. Uh, one word that has also been mentioned by Gergerman, just to, to, to remind you of this, about the recently released feature of claim uh, of a metadata record. Uh, in our attempt to provide an as complete as possible picture of language technology in Europe, uh, ELG has proactively used a number of mechanisms and it has published metadata records of uh, organizations for the time being and uh, later on uh, projects and other items uh, resources. Uh, a user, uh, ideally the owner or an appropriate representative can claim the record uh, ELG will check and assign curation rights to that user, and uh, in what follows, the user undertakes to, to, to enrich it. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Right, for providers of language technology services, there are also a few steps that need to be taken. Uh, language technology providers need to provide a Docker image. As we said, everything runs on Dockers in ELG, the Docker image should contain the language technology tool uh, or, or, or service and all the required dependencies. Uh, Docker images have to be uploaded to a Docker registry like GitLab or Docker Hub or, or Azure. Uh, we're a bit flexible. There are three different options uh, for the provision of language technology tools. Uh, language technology tools may be packaged in, in one image uh, in which case one Docker image is created that contains the application and exposes uh, the ELG compatible endpoint. 
if for any reason language technology tools have to run on uh, on uh, uh, remotely outside the ALG infrastructure, uh, then uh, we need to create one proxy image that exposes one or maybe uh, if needed more uh, uh, ELG compatible endpoints. And uh, 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 there will be cases or there may be cases where language technology tools uh, require an adapter. This is the case where tools already offer an application that exposes uh, uh, an endpoint that is not compatible with, uh, with the ELG end, uh, endpoints. And in such a case, a second adapter image should be created uh, to expose an ELG compatible endpoint. And it will be this that will act as proxy to the container that hosts the language technology tool. Uh, the next slide, please. And now uh, just a few words on uh, how we, uh, we see ELG acting in the wider uh, language technology and, uh, and uh, uh, AI, artificial intelligence ecosystem. As you've seen previously in a slide by Kalina, uh, ELG already offers access to resources provided by other initiatives. Uh, this is important for uh, ELG as by its design and mission, ELG does not operate in, uh, in, in isolation, but it is requested to build bridges to existing platforms and initiatives in the wider language technology and AI area. Uh, the essential first step is always at the level of the registries. Huh? This is the, the, the first thing that uh, uh, one faces uh, uh, as an issue when different platforms and initiatives uh, try to come together. Uh, and uh, uh, when we talk about registries, uh, the critical issue uh, pertains to bridging metadata based descriptions and the underlying schemas uh, or ontologies. Uh, the first, say, formal bridges that have been built are between ELG and uh, ELRC Share, that has been mentioned a couple of times, and Linda Clarin. Uh, ELRC Share, uh, as was mentioned before, is the repository platform of the European Language Resource Coordination Initiative of the European Commission, uh, while Linda Clarin is uh, uh, an important node and center of the Clarin uh, research infrastructure. Uh, both repositories, as of uh, two months ago, both repositories are now automatically harvested by ELG once a week, uh, based on open protocols, namely the we're using the OAI PMH protocol, uh, while we of course respect the specific policies that uh, the harvested repositories uh, uh, want to apply. Uh, and next slide, please. Another important uh, initiative with uh, which ELG has started technical talks uh, quite some uh, time ago uh, regarding linking and cross-fertilization is the AI for EU, uh, the AI on demand platform that has been launched by, by the European Commission. Uh, ELG and AI for EU have uh, started developing mappers between the respective metadata models. Uh, this is a rather challenging task due to the rather horizontal nature of AI for EU and uh, the absolutely language dedicated and uh, rather deeper analytical model of, uh, of ELG. Uh, uh, still, uh, we're uh, very, very close uh, to uh, getting the thing done. Uh, establishing such a mapping will, uh, will allow and uh, enable ELG to act as the the dedicated gateway, the dedicated language technology and understanding arm of uh, uh, um, AI in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and with this, I believe um, I have, uh, I, or I hope, I have uh, somehow created some uh, interest to you to come and visit us at the, at the ELG booth. Uh, where we can uh, have uh, uh, a, a live demo of uh, the ELG platform and uh, uh, have, get, get your ideas, suggestions, questions, uh, uh, etc. Jörg, back to you. Great. Thanks so much, Stelios. And also thanks again to Kalina. So I will quickly wrap up. Um, so what we are trying to do with ELG is we want to establish ELG as the primary platform and marketplace for language technology in Europe. And this is not, not a thing that wants to dominate something, but it's an initiative from the community for the community. This is very important to stress. 
Um, we have shown that the European LT landscape is highly fragmented and we want to provide just the right umbrella platform for this highly fragmented community. And we've also seen that the global market size by 2025 is absolutely enormous and we want the European LT community to be a key player and participant in this market. Already now, not only in 2025, but already now. And we want to increase the visibility and reach of all members of the European LT landscape, which is one of the reasons why we uh, invested really a lot of time and effort into collecting all these organization lists, which we are now making available in ELG. And this is a long-term initiative. We will establish a legal entity for sustainability purposes. We also want to contribute to the long-term goal of digital language equality in Europe by giving all our languages one virtual home and umbrella platform that collects all services and resources. And this is an important bridge to the ELE project, which was mentioned, and we will talk about this in more detail tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. And the next steps are pretty obvious. We now are in the process of developing further populating ELG release two with functional services and resources and additional features of the platform to be made available in early 2021 release three in early 2022 and then we also want to establish the legal entity of course so <clears throat> that concludes the elg overview presentation um, and as stelios mentioned um, we have one booth that runs throughout all project expos and that's the elg booth yeah we thought that maybe we should uh, we should be there for you to ask questions um, Katrin, do we have any any immediate questions right now from the participants? No, we have answered already everything. Okay, no. very good. Okay, excellent. So, um, so right now we decided we discussed it and we decided not to do a live demo now, but we can do the live demo as Stereo said in the booth. Yeah. So, please please come either today or in one of the other expo sessions, and then we can show you what's what. Now we are um, in the, we are of, oh, already 10 minutes over time, unfortunately. So um, let's take a virtual coffee break right now and let's reconvene in this channel. You can stay connected, obviously, um, in about 10 minutes. Yeah, so maybe uh, 10 to 11. Uh, that reduces the coffee time a little bit, but we want to stick to the time schedule. So let's uh, take 10 and see you at 10 to 11. Thank you very much.